Yeah, it's good. We have a good uh, intimate group. So you guys can really ask us anything. You can <clears throat> talk to us about anything you want. Um, and we'll we'll just go ahead and introduce ourselves and get this started. Buki, want to start? Uh, great. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Um, I'm Bukola Adebayo, a senior producer with the digital team in, in CNN in Lagos, Nigeria. Do you guys know Nigeria? I'm just asking. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the bureau is quite small, but we do cover stories across Africa. We have three bureaus in, in Africa, Lagos, Nairobi and South Africa. So uh, we sort of oversee news across the continent using all the resources we have in this bureau. Uh, my job basically is to identify uh, the top stories every day, get people to cover it, footage, films, stories, all the story elements. And um, as you know, CNN has a website. We also have a TV and the TV is the strongest, is the most popular uh, arm of the network. and whatever we do is also tailored to the TV, aside also the website. So basically that covers what I do. I'm gonna to toss it to Amber. Um, so uh, my name is Amber Payne and I am most recently, my, my role was at BET Digital where I was overseeing uh, editorial content for the website and also overseeing uh, video for the website. So. Um, it could involve working with the writers and overseeing and managing the day to day stories that were coming in, <clears throat> but also working on developing uh, franchises for the uh, for the digital uh, really for BET.com, um, but also some material for YouTube um, customized for YouTube, we had different strategies for YouTube and for the website. So that's what I was most recently doing. Um, and Buki and I are happy to talk to you guys today and uh, tell us, tell you guys about our careers and, and ask you, you know, you can ask us anything you want, but, you know, I think we first, since we just have, you know, the few of us, um, it would be great to hear from you guys and, and just, if you want to introduce yourselves to us and tell us, you know, what made you interested in, in uh, coming to our session, what you want to get out of this. Well, I guess I can start. Um, so my name is Sheila. I'm from Orange Park, Florida, right outside of Jacksonville. Um, right now I'm a freshman at UPenn. Um, and right now I'm the West Philadelphia beat reporter. And in general, like what draws me to journalism is the opportunity to use storytelling to influence people positively. Because um, unfortunately there are so many stories I feel like that aren't told. And so like as a journalist, I feel like that's one of my main goals to use storytelling to give a voice to communities that are overlooked. And specifically, I would love to go into broadcast journalism. So being on the camera. So I'd love to like hear during the session, like your advice on how to do that. Because currently right now I'm in print, um, which I think is very useful, you know, becoming a great writer, but I'd love to hear your advice on how to transition or <laughs> yeah, just all of that. Damn, Sheila, you are so cool. Um, <laughs> my name is Vanessa. I'm a senior at Bates College, which is a small NESCAC in Maine. Um, I am, I run our small paper at Bates, uh, the Bates student, uh, the editor in chief. Um, I am really interested in multimedia journalism specifically, um, how to use different platforms to tell a story, because I think that words are incredibly informative, but they can kind of only do so much sometimes. And sometimes like the visual or more interactive elements I think are really important. Um, I think the thing that draws draws me to journalism is, I, I, I really like local journalism specifically. Um, and I really, really enjoy how a newspaper is able to really just like bring people together, like a local news station, like a radio, whatever it may be, just from celebrating the little achievements of the community that might otherwise um, go untold. Um, I'm a huge fan of CNN also. So <laughs> super, super cool to get to meet you both um, and very excited to hear about your experiences. Amber, just take it away. I mean, Amber has walked in both TV. I mean, she's walked both on TV, on camera, behind camera. She's in digital. She's She's headed many, um, many operations. So I, I think she would just take it away and I'll, I'll come back. All right. Uh, well, I guess I'll just, I'll tell you guys how I got my start, um, which my start was 
going into broadcast. Uh, so I went to University of Virginia and there was no um, you know, TV station, there was a paper. I was more interested in design and graphic design and page layout. You know, I thought maybe I would do magazine layouts. And I ended up getting an internship for NBC Nightly News uh, at the time with Tom Brokaw. And so I really was put with their graphics producer because that's what I was really interested in. Um, how did I get the internship? It was an alumni connection. An alumni came to our university and he talked to my major, which was a small major called media studies. And it was more history and theory of media. Um, and this the senior producer from NBC Nightly News came and was, you know, just talking to us about what he did. I kept in touch with him. Um, so that's kind of just step one of just the connections and like your alumni connections and just looking into those and, and seeing, you know, people are very, uh, I know it does stand out to me. If I get an, an email from a UVA alum, it does kind of pique my eyes a little bit more because, you know, there's just that, that connection and familiarity. That's really, that, that's just how it is with the whole, you know, it's who you know thing. So looking for connections with people and having a shared connection with somebody that you're reaching out to um, always, it always helps. It's not impossible without that, but it does help. So um, I got the internship at NBC and uh, that summer I learned what a producer was. <laughs> Um, you know, what is a producer? You know, what are the jobs in broadcast? If you want to get into broadcast television. So this was the, the evening news, you know, every seven days a week on at 630, just like clockwork. Everyone traditionally used to go and sit down and watch the news. Now there are so many other options and uh, no one has cable. So um, a lot more to compete with now, but, uh, but at the time I, I was able to, you know, do my internship, I got to do my own story. And then I really fell in love with just the idea of, wow, I can, you know, come up with ideas and I can put them together and I can work with a team. It's very, it's collaborative. I mean, you know, that's kind of picking up on that from you too, Vanessa, just this collaboration of people coming together to put something together. Um, to tell one story. And it might just be a two minute story that you worked all day on or you worked all month on just here and there. And uh, you just have this little window to to put it out to the world. But there's just something that I found so satisfying about that process of the research, of interviewing people, of, you know, fact checking, you know, maybe looking for data, making calls, trying to find the right people to interview. Um, sometimes that takes time. So I got my foot in the door at Weekend Nightly News, and um, I was a production assistant researcher. So that involved not only just doing whatever the producers asked me to do, you know, okay, make, back in this day, it was like, make VHS, dubbing VHS tapes and, you know, going to get tapes and digitizing things and, and logging, transcribing interviews for hours. Um, there's so much technology that, kind of makes that whole process a little quicker, but I really learned a lot from all of the grunt work. And I think that's kind of, you know, one thing I learned my first couple of years in was it, the producers were essentially testing me to see, you know, okay, if I could, if I could, if I can transcribe this three hour interview without complaints, do it well, highlight the great sound bites, um, then maybe I'll get to go on the shoot with them the next time. You know, you just, Kind of had to keep proving yourselves to everyone that i'm willing to do anything i'll sit and answer the phones and i'll go and get the executive producer coffee but i hope that you know with with a with like a good attitude and a positive attitude and also asking you know kind of raising my hand can i can i go on that shoot with you can i sit in the edit room with you to see how you work um that's one thing that you just you cannot be afraid to ask because there are always someone who's going to ask and you may be the person um, who just, I had to learn not to just sit there and quietly do my work and hope that everyone noticed and rewarded me for it. Um, that doesn't work um, because it's just, things are moving such fast pace. It's, it's you know, you, 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 you stand out with doing great work, of course, but it's kind of that extra edge if you're the one that's, you know, kind of willing to do anything and volunteer yourself. Um, so, uh, you also may fall in love with working in the control room. Um, and I know Sheila, you, you're interested in being on camera. I'd say 
that's an amazing goal and you're you're doing the right thing with just kind of getting this print background down and getting your reporting down um because i think that the best some of the best uh anchors and reporters they were producers so they know how both sides work so i know a lot of people who are eager to just really just start with being on camera and i think it's worth that time to be working as a producer on the other side setting up the stories working with crews um doing all the work that is the behind the scenes work as a producer um so from there uh in the control room i would i would have to time the show so you know the show is it's really a 22 minute broadcast with commercials and it all magically comes together when you turn on your TV, right? It's just back to back to back, seamless. Really, it could be chaos in the control room. Stories are getting finished up to the minute before they air. I had a story, I've had so many close calls, I've never missed air, but so many close calls where my story wasn't finished until like two minutes before it was supposed to air to the broadcast to the world. And it's, you know, this feeling of stress, but adrenaline, and then you feel so exhilarated when it's over. Um, but for any procrastinator, you know, as long as you get it done, I, I always got a paper in on 11.59 p.m. <laughs> and did, did okay. Uh, you just make that deadline. Um, so meeting deadlines uh, was definitely, I, I need, I still need deadlines. I need deadlines. And I, I know that I'll be pushing it to the, to the limit, but I, I will make the deadline. Um, so uh, that was fun to work in a live control room where things are always changing. And if the show is over, you know, they call it the show is heavy, then you you might have to move some things around in the show or, OK, we're going to we're going to kill that uh, voiceover about, you know, the parade that happened today. We're just going to eliminate that from the show because we're 20 seconds heavy, you know, so it's just this live experience. And I hope one day you get to be in a control room to see how that all comes together um, and all of the people that are involved in that. Um, but from there, I did become an associate producer. That was the next step. And as associate producer, I had a little more responsibility to, you know, I could do shoots. I would go on shoots for producers, go on, inter conduct interviews, set up more interviews. And I started to get to produce my own stories and be, you know, the lead producer on them. Um, and that involved, you know, working with working with the anchor or working with the reporter talent. Um, and uh, sometimes you're writing the story with them. Um, sometimes you're writing the story for them at the network. These reporters are doing multiple stories at a time, a story for the Today Show, a story for MSNBC. So there were times where I would maybe draft the script and then they would take it, take it on and, and you know, put it into their put on their touches. Um, but I really liked the process of uh, producing, of finding a story, um, setting it up, making calls. You you can't be afraid to pick up the phone. Uh, there's something, you know, there's kind of like a, a special power you get, I think, as a journalist, because it's, you know, I don't love, you know, just going up to pe random people, but you just, you just do it. Um, I remember the when Michael Jackson died, I, I was asked, I was working on that Sunday and I bought a one-way ticket to LA <laughs> to help with covering the funeral. And one of my first jobs was to go to LAX airport and just try to find people who were flying in to go to the funeral. How do you do that? I was standing outside the terminal and I was just looking at people and trying to get a sense. And I was just asking random people like, oh, are, are you here for, are, did you fly in for Michael Jackson's funeral? I mean, it was ridiculous, but I ended up finding like two people. <laughs> and so you just never know where it's gonna take you when you're working in TV. You, you, can, you can go to the craziest corners of the earth. You're, you're asking people things you never thought you'd ask, but you, you learn to really uh, have good personal skills and communicate with people and make people feel at ease. You're sticking a camera in their face. How do you assure them that you know, that's gonna be okay. That, you know, how do you get people to trust you? You know, so it's it's a lot of lessons learned of 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 uh, getting people to trust you, that you're you're here to tell their story, you wanna give them their voice. Um, 
you want to give the story justice. And, you know, there are a lot of times you have to really kind of convince people. I'm sure Buki has had experiences too, where someone says, no, yes. no, I don't want to do the interview. No, I don't want to do the interview. And then you kind of eventually get them to, to the yes. Um, but that's kind of my, that's how I got my, my start is at NBC News. And so I spent 10 years there. I was able to cover uh, the Olympics in Vancouver one year. Um, I traveled to parts of Africa, um, Sierra Leone and Ghana. And um, when Nelson Mandela died, I was part of our team to go and cover the funeral um, in South Africa. Um, and then just, I also loved going to the middle of nowhere, Iowa to cover the granny basketball team and their league that they had. You know, I'd loved going just to the middle of anywhere that I'd never been before. So if you do like to travel, you know, that was a really amazing opportunity that I did have at the network level to do that. But, um, you know, working in local j journalism and local TV is also just, you can really, um, it's such an important, it is such an important role. It's such an important field. And a lot of times at the network, we're look, we're always looking at what are the, what did the affiliates do? What did the local stations do? That's how some of those amazing stories get to that national level. It's, it really feeds up and, um, there are some really strong markets that do incredible uh, investigative work um, and just do incredible service um, that all, always that does rise out to to a national level. So I think on both accounts, it's uh, I really loved being in in broadcast and TV. So um, Buki. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to interview each other back and forth so you can see just how comfortable you have to be with camera, how you have to also be in the in the moment and just really, really comfortable with your audience. But we'll go back to that. So but I will talk about how I started in print. I was working for a local newspaper for nine years. Then something unexpected really happened. I got a Pulitzer grant. Uh, we know the Pulitzer Center, right? So they give grants for you to tell very visual stories. And um, even in the process, before you get the grant, you have to pitch what the visual element of that story is going to be. So a lot of stories have been written. They wanted something new. Are you going to be showing data? Are you going to be showing graphics? Are you going to be showing drone footages? Are you going to actually film in, the, in, the, what, in whatever community you want to film or you, however you want to tell the story? They wanted something more than print. And that's not something I had done before. But I, I sort of, um, like Amber said, you need to work with a lot of contacts. I reached out to my colleagues in TV and said, you know what, I have this project. I need to film it. How are you going to help me? And I got someone with me. And we walked through this, how just to be comfortable with the camera. And a lot of research, like as a, when you are writing for print, you are not thinking visual. You think visually, you have photos, but you are not thinking, it's more of a show, not tell when you are filming. You, you can describe the community in words, but when you are filming, people need to see that and you need to get different shots. I, I, I had no clue about that. So I worked with someone and a very great guy. He had like 10 years experience in, in filming on, uh, not just behind, not just in the control room, but also filming outside, which is a totally different world entirely because now you are working in a, an environment that is not controlled. You are bringing camera into somewhere private and people just don't want, you can't just shove your camera into people's faces. Like Amber said, you need to make, I was surprised how much people don't want to be on camera. That was the first shock for me. For print, you call them, you want to interview them, they are ready to chat with you and sit with you. But once you say you're going to film, there's a bit of pushback, like they want to know where are you going to film, what, I, what am I going to say? They also want to be knowledgeable when they are talking to you. They also want to sort of gauge the kind of vulnerability they want to show you on camera. Those were the kind, those were the first two things that really surprised me because the first thing we, I wanted to film a story about how um, Elega Sandridge, it was an environment story about how sand was being taken from Nigeria to Dubai. 
uh, mm -hmm. and how this was also affecting the communities in terms of they were excavating the sand is very technical. So that's why the Pulitzer Center wanted visuals. How do we get people to key into this story without having to read it? So, so much text. Anyway, it was an investigative story. We're going to show how people were coming in the middle of the night or maybe early in the morning to just do a lot of business in this community. And um, a lot of things were happening. The houses were sinking because once you dig into somewhere, is, there's a probability that the house will cave in. And people were doing this overnight, so a lot of the residents were not aware. And we just needed to show that. How do we show that we had to think of drone footage over shooting, that, trying to put a drone in the community? Just, I mean, if somebody is sitting in New York and I'm telling a story about Nigeria, you want to see. And we thought, okay, the best way is just to give an area uh, view of the place and thanks to drone you don't need before you have to probably shoot a plane over, over those places but we used the drone, a drone footage we had to get permission to do that we had to speak to people make people comfortable enough because we are going to not just film what was happening we wanted people to see that there are fishermen in this village there are farmers in this village there are there are people, children going to school in this in this community and that was going to take at least three days. And we had to just talk to people, chat with people, and just make them really, really comfortable. Mm -hmm. And just to get a sense of what can we show? What can we not show? Mm -hmm. Who is ready to talk to us? Who is not ready to talk to us? Who is going to be back in the camera? Who is going to be facing the camera? So many things. It was something I'd never done. And that was, yeah, that, I thought I was not going to be able to do it, but at least working with it, uh, somebody that had the experience was, I was able to situate myself into it. Anyway, we published um, that story and somebody from the CNN Bureau in London reached out to me and said, I love this work. Uh, and I'm very, I, I normally don't put my work out there. Like we have the social media team. They are the ones that do all that. But I was just, what the police center was like, you have to share this story, put it on Facebook put it on this, talk about it, continue tweeting about it. I was like, okay, fine. Then I put it on Facebook, the head of the bureau in CNN London. So CNN London is actually, um, they handle all the international outlook for CNN and the CNN in the US handle the domestic outlook. So somebody in CNN London reached out to me and said, are you interested in this position, interviewing for it? Uh, we've seen a bit of your, of your work. And we would like to see uh, if you're interested in learning more about this and that. And that was how I began the application process and um, did the interview and got into, got into the bureau. I came to New York for two weeks or three weeks and did a bit of training because now I needed to see how the operation looks like. Mm -hmm. A lot of research goes into, like Amber has been saying, the best TV anchors are the people that have walked behind. They've been producers. They've been on the field. They are on top of every situation. They know as much as, so the producer is doing all the research, which I, I, I'm a senior producer. So I do all the, all the research. I do, like if news is breaking, you need to say, as immediately they finish saying it on TV, there needs to be updates. As you see on CNN, they are updating every time about news. The producers behind the scene are doing that. But also the TV anchor is also checking, they are checking all the updates, working their contacts, trying to call people. And they, the TV anchors also have a lot of contacts. All, I mean, they are the ones speaking to governors, authorities, officials, and all that. They have all these contacts. And they need to keep checking. So it's like Amber said, it's such, it's like a, I like to say, I call it a production, but all hands are on deck. That's why they say a TV crew. Because yeah. so everybody must get it right. Deadlines are important. You must get the information at the right time because don't forget you also have competitors. CNN has BBC, MSNBC. You don't want, the TV anchor does not want to be mouthing something that happened 20 minutes ago when MSNBC is saying something that is happening right now. Mm -hmm. So a lot of eyes, that's why when you see the control room, you are watching also your competitors. You want to see what they have that you don't have. It's not just about what you have. It's also about what others have that you quickly need to put into, into, uh, 
into whatever segment or whatever uh, production or package you are, you, are, you are working on. So yeah, I'm still learning, still like, like there are days that I, I'm not really the on-camera person. I sort of like, let me give an example. Uh, there was a time around 200 girls were kidnapped in Nigeria. And of course, we don't have footage of the kidnapped girls. They are somewhere, we don't have proof of that, we don't have that. But we need somebody to talk about this. And we need somebody that is on top of the situation. We also need to hear from the government. We need to hear from experts. And part of my job is just to book, we call it booking, just to book the right person to come on screen. Who is the person that has the gravitas, that is also comfortable on camera, that has spoken publicly about this. I mean, that was the time um, Michelle Obama, um, Malala, a lot of people were holding this Bring Back Our Girls uh, placard. Mm -hmm. And if it's coming from that, you also want to put somebody with as much personality, as much gravitas as some, well, not really like Michelle Obama, but you also need to book the right person and you need to be quick on your feet. Mm -hmm. You need to be quick on your feet. You need to get, you need to talk to as many people as possible. Don't overlook any contact and just reach out to your colleagues, even if, then another product in another TV or in another network, just reach out to them. What are you hearing? And all that. It's, it's competitive, but it's also quite collaborative. Yeah. So, yeah, that that's those those are the kind of uh, those are the kind of behind the scene work. I mean, if an Amampo says she wants to interview somebody about bring back her girls because she has just spoken to Michelle Obama about uh, girl education and what is happening and. I also need to bring somebody from Nigeria that has the same, um, that has worked with girls, that, has, um, that they have programs around girls and just someone that also will be available. You, you want to book somebody that can quickly come on screen. Well, with Zoom, it's easier to get people to, to tune in from wherever they were born. Right then, you are thinking of who is in the city that you can talk to. Who is more open to to come into to this program as quickly as possible? So, beauty—it's a lot, but it's, you learn you learn in the process. So there's really—I I felt, oh my God, how do I transition from print to 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 TV or digital? And I found that that is not as difficult as I thought, but it's definitely not as easy as 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 maybe other people think it is. It's a lot of work, a lot of research, and a lot of reading, a lot of talking to people, talking. I mean, if I wanted to do something, I'll talk to Amber. How do you think I should do it? How do you think it works? Because she has more years than I have. I'm not going to assume that um, I, I know a lot because, of course, every day uh, there's a lot of, also, it's not just TV now. I mean, you have so many multimedia platforms they are doing really, really great stuff. So TV too has competition now. So yeah. 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 And I think you you bring up two things that I wanted to just double on. Booking, booking producer, that's a whole job. There are, CNN has, I mean, obviously Buki books people. I I book people because we have people we know, but there's a team dedicated to booking for like the cable networks, and they're the ones um that do that so that's an interesting and definitely high pressure job sometimes when there's breaking news there's competition to get people um but i think what i wanted to bring out of that which also this fits to for for either of you for tv or for you know for print finding the right voice and finding the right person um i've had times where i found the perfect expert oh they wrote this book on the topic they're an expert they've been quoted in this magazine, they're authoritative. And then when you when you put them on camera, they are there's, you know, there's a phrase that people in TV use, are they good on camera? I mean, that is it really means are they compelling? Are they, you know, can are they clear? Are they uh succinct with their points? Um, because you may have the perfect expert who's at the top of their field but they may not translate into an interview on camera. And that um, is going to do a disservice to your audience. They may turn away, they may get bored. And so it can be the most frustrating thing when you, when you keep going to maybe your senior producer, if I was working for Buki and I'd say, I found this person they're they're so great. And then Buki turns around and says, well, I see them doing this 
this speech? Um, did you did you do you have any examples of them speaking? Oh, here's a conference they did, and they're dry and boring. Buki's going to say that that's not going to work. I know that they're the best on that topic, but we need someone who can really translate it to our our viewers. So that plays through even in a in a print interview. Um, and and sometimes we're in a rush and we're trying to get things done, and and we want to cut corners to just go with the person we have because we're out of time but it's like you have to keep pushing yourself to to find something better and ha find the best person and that the best soundbite you may interview 20 people to get three quotes um and and you have to be able to tell people you know i hope to use this this is part of my research i never promise anybody they're going to be on camera um, but I actually wanted to um, bring Leah into the conversation just to talk a little bit about multimedia and how local papers um, really need the savvy multimedia uh, people because that's that's what her background is also in. So Leah, what did you, what could you add to to that conversation? Absolutely. So just really quick, when I was in journalism school, my emphasis was was in um, convergence journalism, which is really just a fancy way of saying multimedia journalism. And I found as I came into the industry that multimedia skills, video production skills, audio production skills are incredibly useful and important to surprisingly print newsrooms. So I worked in um, three different newspaper newsrooms. I worked in a completely digital newsroom that focused specifically on video where I was actually like an on air person, which was totally weird for me because that really isn't my background. But um, at every single newspaper, those skills were so important and so helpful and they really helped translate uh, important investigation into multiple platforms for different audiences. So when you're working on a story, um, let's say you're working on a print story, but it's about something that when you see it, it impacts you differently than when you read about it. So if you're the person in that scenario, in that newsroom that has the multimedia skills, you have the ability to really trans translate that story to a new platform where it might even impact people to a greater extent. So I would just encourage you both to as you know, you um, make your multimedia skills better as you, you know, emphasize that you really love to work with video, don't necessarily count out print formats because they could really use your skills. And um, because especially when it comes to print, they're sort of transitioning to more of a digital space in a lot of respects, video specifically is big online and it really helps make those stories pop on the digital format. That's a good a good point. Um, Buki, you kind of work at this cross section of print, multimedia, the TV, you know, the broadcast. Um, can you talk about just, you know, the life of one story? You may have one story that's a print story. What could make that print story into either a, a video for digital or some kind of multimedia element for digital? Like when you're looking at just, oh, here's a story we need to do kind of what kind of decisions are made about, um, or maybe if you have any examples too about how to make that, whether that story warrants a different platform. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks Amber. Um, what quickly comes to my mind is when you are covering protests. Um, protests work, on, you can write about a protest, you can film a protest and you can do a digital, okay, so I'm, I'm just gonna give an example. There was um, sometimes last year, uh, there was a bit of protest around the world against police brutality and the one in Nigeria sort of kicked off. So I wrote the digital story, which is the, the one for the website, but also you want people to see the kind of outrage on ground. You want to see how people are just really, really tired of this. And a lot of people have footage films that they've taken of people being beaten, police just, I mean, we have the George Floyd video, right? We have a lot of videos of police brutality, I mean, captured by citizens or any, or even by journalists. And it's good to write about, you can write about a particular protest, but I think 
those are stories, stories that have to do with action. They translate to all mediums. So you could write a story about a protest, put a photo of, of people protesting. Then you could do a short digital video of just cutting short, short clips of people protesting, inserting clips of a George Floyd, uh, the footage of the George Floyd, and also other previous forms of police brutality that have been captured on camera. And that does a good job for people that maybe they just don't want to read it. They just want to see this one minute video and that works for them. And that probably that's what they would just want to share with their friend and it provokes more emotion from somebody. I mean, if you read about George Floyd, I'm not sure you'd be as outraged as if you saw the video. And not just in the video of George Floyd, you are seeing the video of all that, you are seeing social clips telling you that this is, this is a systemic problem. The video does a job of telling you that this is not just one person, this is something a lot of people are experiencing and that works for one minute video. And it also works for TV because that is where you can also get a lot of feedback. You know, for video, you have, you have to be mindful of time. I'm not sure you will sit to watch a video of protest for more than one minute or 30 seconds or one minute, 30 seconds, you are done with that. And if you are doing that for TV, it's also the same thing, but it transitions differently because now you need more voices. You need, you need the victims, you need, I mean, maybe Judge Floyd's mother, auntie, sister, cousins. You need to speak with people probably in the area where it happened just to get a sense of, is this something that happens in black neighborhoods? You need people to say it. It's not just for you to write it. You need, like, you need to think visually now. So th those are the kind of protest stories. I think they lend to different mediums. And um, a lot of the things you're also thinking about, you may set out to write a story for your website or your paper. But if you are working, if you, if you are trying to think multimedia and think visually, it starts from where you set out to cover that story. You just don't, you, you think of who to talk to, it, you think of who will have the best sound bites, what are the reactions? It's not just about what is happening. It's not just about covering the protest. You also want to see how others are reacting to this protest. You want to see, oh, is there, is there some form of, um, I mean, so many things are happening around the protest. You also want to give whoever is watching it on video, whoever is watching it on TV, you want them to feel that they are right in the, in the moment. So um, and I, I just wanted to touch on what Leah said. I found that, that coming from a print background has really made me understand how much uh, information we have to give. I mean, there's, there are some things you know that probably people working in TV or pop doing the video cuts don't know about fact checking, about research, about data. I mean, if you are print, that's, that's what you are thinking of. You are thinking of words to fill a story. And yes, they need a shorter form of what you have in print, but they also need to have the full picture. So I, I think that it, it sort of complements each other. And just the difference is you have to just think visually. If there's a sound, you need to capture that. that sound needs to be captured. If there's if there's a fight, you can write about a fight, but you just need to capture if something has descended into fiscal, people need to see it. So that that's that that's that's an example that has pretty much come to my mind on the story elements uh, we are looking for. Like I said, the story I did for Polita, the multimedia elements was we had the drone footage, we had um, satellite maps just to show people. This is where this is happening and all that. So yeah, and and it's, I mean, it's a collaborative work. There are people that have um, infograph that good with infographics. People, some people have good with video, and you just need to look at which one works for a particular story. Like if you are, if you are another example that comes to my mind is when you are talking to people, maybe teenagers. You are doing a story about teenagers, and you don't want to show their faces for privacy reasons. I think that's the story that lends itself to audio and print. And um, so it, it really depends on the context of the story you're, you're working on. And you need to make those quick calls before you even go out to, to look for the story or, or once you are being pulled into that story, yeah.
Well, I want to leave time for you guys to ask us questions about anything else. Um, I would just add that uh, looking at examples of, of multimedia, um, I, I don't have anything that I've done personally that I feel is amazingly worth sharing. That's kind of like a multimedia interactive, but there, are, you know, I like to look at when awards come out, like the online news association or Emmys or, you know, any of those awards, I'd say that would be um, great for a journalist, any journalist, young or older, just to see what's out there. It's like, there's so much out there. It's a lot to keep up with and you can get ideas from um, how other papers are doing things. There are just some incredible things. The New York Times is doing like beautiful, different kinds of storytelling, but you know, so are local papers around the country um, really investing into really special um, multimedia uh, productions. And I would also just add that for both of you to learn People who are hiring are really expecting, you know, like young people coming out of college to kind of just know how to do all of the technical things. Oh, do you, you know, are you on social media? Like you, you're on Snapchat, are you on this, are you on that? You know, do you know how to shoot? Do you know how to edit? I mean, even if you don't want to be an editor or a shooter, um, you should try to learn, even just, you know, take one course or throw yourself into um, that experience of, of, of filming a story um, and see what that takes because it takes, it really is a process. I mean, even, you know, Vanessa, you may want to assign um, a video to, to one of your journalists and for you to have, to know, have knowledge of, you know, what, what does it take to set up a shot and to, to make sure the lighting is right. And <clears throat> what does it take to edit that together and how much footage do you need? And, how much uh, B-roll do you need of that subject that you captured? Do you just need them walking down the street one time? You're going to get to your edit room and say, I have nothing to cover this story. So even just for you as, as, as the managing editor, editor in chief, you know, to do all the jobs or what is it like to be on camera? Um, you know, Vanessa, maybe you don't want to be on camera, but at least by maybe make it, you know, doing something like getting yourself out of the comfort zone to just kind of learn it then you really know how to work with that person. You know how to work with your talent or work with your uh, photographer because you've you've kind of gone out there and tried it yourself. So you can really um, speak, speak. And it's also like learning to speak the language and learning to communicate the language. And there's a lot that can be done now. I mean, when I was at BET and the pandemic hit, I was just, we were just about to launch all these fancy franchises that we were going to shoot in our studios. And I had to find a way to um, do them with people at home and have people film on their iPhones or film on Zoom and still make that look interesting. And it was uh, a lot of trial and error. I had people film themselves and then send it to me and there's no audio and we redid the interview. You know, they're just, it was like a total <laughs> learning process. I have some interviews up that, you know, I'm like, oh, that doesn't look that great, but you know, we got it done. It could have looked better, but I, I literally worked with this woman for an hour to set up her shot and we just had to do it. Um, so you, it's all, it's all trial and error right now with digital media and um, looking at trying new things from audio storytelling, you know, that may be one great way or audio snippets. You don't have to do a three, a seven part podcast. Maybe you're going to just embed some audio into the story that you did um, a, a 30 second snippet from your interview with this person because it's really powerful. So kind of just find those ways like to make things you know, look a little different or more interesting um, and, and start small and just try to, you know, look at what else is what else is out there. Um, so, I mean, with that, I just wanted to turn it back to you guys to see, you know, what else you wanted to to know or anything else specific you guys wanted to ask because we have, I guess, what do we have left? Like 10 minutes? Uh, I, I'll go first, I guess. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about like your work-life balance um, with, um, with what you do, because I feel like for a lot of journalism, that ends up being a really challenging aspect. Like, are you able to go in to the, like, go into the office and, like, or the studio and do your work and leave and feel mm -hmm. like you can kind of set it aside for a bit? Or how, like, how do you manage that? Um, I mean, I'll go first. I think it depends. It really depends where you are and where, where you're working. It kind of does depend a bit on your, your level. 
I would say when I first started out, I, uh, I wanted the hours. I was 23. I would work a lot. I would stay late for people. I would come in on weekends and I wouldn't exactly suggest that. I know that there were times where I did it to try to stand out and try to be the saying yes, but I had to learn um, to say, I had to learn when to say, no, I can't do that. Um, And then I kind of just had to learn, okay, I need to be more efficient with getting my work done in this time period. And I can't just blame it on, you know, that producer, like I need to know what I can manage. So I think it is a learning process of finding the balance of you want to be the go-to person. You want to be the one people can count on, but you can't, uh, that can take a toll. It took a toll on, you know, friendships and, and relationship I was in. Um, just, you know, I would always just be staying late to get things done. Um, as I kind of have, and as an, growing as a media executive, you know, I, I, I also started a site for NBC news called NBC black NBC BLK. And that was like a startup. So, I worked again, I, I, I was, I at least had flexibility of when I could start my day, um, whether I sometimes I stayed home or worked from home. Um, but there were just times where, uh, because I was trying to really launch this and grow the platform, I felt that, okay, well, Prince died on a Friday night. Like we gotta, we, I gotta get people writing stories like all weekend. I need to, you know, like that, was my desire. No one was telling me to do it, but because it was my site, my section, I just was like, I have to be on this. Um, So it it is, it is challenge. It's very challenging because when breaking news happens, you know, depending on what kind of sector of news you're in, you may be in a role. I mean, I have friends who are field producers who, if something breaks in the Southeast, in the middle of the night, they will get the call. Hey, you need to start driving to Alabama now. There was an explosion. And that's, you know, that's what they signed up for. Um, as a producer, my role as a producer, I wasn't, that wasn't my, I didn't sign up for that, but I knew that from nine to seven, I would be at work, I'd be working hard. And I knew that uh, if I had to, if I wanted to do things outside of that, like I didn't have time to research a story I really wanted to do, then I might need to do that on my own time. Um, so I'd say it's a, it's learning journalism. It's hard. It's a grind and it's learning when to say no. Um, I turned down a huge producing a huge interview with like one of the biggest Olympians because I, I had a friend's wedding and I was like, if I don't make it back in time for the wedding, like, that is done. And I'm going to say no to this producer who's going to look at me like I'm crazy for turning this down, getting to produce this interview. Um, but it was fine. I'm Things moved on. She gave me other opportunities. She gave me other chances. I was able to kind of, you know, keep myself in the mix with her. So it's, um, it's setting boundaries. I'm now a mom. And I, I, as a mom, I would, when I, went back to work, I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm leaving at six, like, or I'm leaving at five, like, that is when I'm leaving. And I will be taking a break from like five to nine. And then I'll check some emails and maybe reply to them. But like, that's not negotiable. Like, I I can't, I don't have that time. So putting up those barriers is, is what you learn to do. And it is not always easy to do. And, and I can't tell you that you, you always wonder, is this, is it going to be okay? Is it not going to be okay? And Usually it is, but it's just, that's a feeling that I always have of, of, am I, am I proving myself? I mean, even now I have this, am I proving myself high enough? Oh, we have five minutes left. Oh boy. Okay. I've talked too much. Fuki. <laughs> oh, I, I honestly have the, I, I think I'm biased some bit. I really, well, Dad. I think is. <sighs> I, wherever you, I mean, starting out, when you're starting out young, you're so excited, you're ready to put in all the hours to learn and just just find, get learn the ropes and all that. So I think it's it, it really depends on you, on the individual, really. I It's such a personal question. I But my advice would just be, yes, always strive for work and life balance, no matter what, because especially in journalism, you're as good as your last, your last breaking news, your last investigative report. 
your last package or whatever. I mean, your like Amber said, your producer was like, why did you turn that, that interview or why didn't you produce this or what? But trust me, the following day, there'll be something for you to produce that is excellent, that is good, but you still have to put in extra hours to make it good. So you need to just pick when and when you, you want to do it. But I'm not so sure how easy it is for younger folks to do that, but. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's all about communication too. I think it's clear yeah. communication with your your the people you're working with, and you know, for people who, if I've if I've had a time as a manager to say, oh hey, you know, are you are you available to work late on this? And if they're just honest with me, you know, no, I can't. But you know, tomorrow the first thing I'll do will be to to get right on that. You know, just finding that way because people will also take it for granted that you are the one that's oh she always says she'll always stay late and come in early you don't want to be having yeah yeah, yeah. because I, I i was that person for like two years and it took a serious toll on me so i <laughs> once once they know they can always count on you to put in the extra hours i mean to be good is more work so yeah but there is a crunch time of of, of learning and i think um there were just times where i thought well i want to get that I want to go on that shoot on a Saturday because I want to try to shoot the story on my own and and I know I'm gonna spend all day running around with my camera but I need to see if I can do this and I need I want to learn this um, so if you are finding that things are interfering I hope it's a learning experience but I mean family friends relationships uh, it's so important it's it's what strengthens you to 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 get through the work so um, it's a very personal process but you, you have to preserve that the best you can. Okay, so I have a question. It's kind of, I don't know, it's a little complex, but um, so first off, I just wanna say, this has made me super, super excited about just like getting experience in different places. Um, but with that, like, what's your advice? Like, so for me personally, there's only a journalism minor at UPenn. And um, like I said, like there's not like a news crew or anything. Um, so how do I go about getting experience um, in these different forms of journalism? And also, do you have any advice on like whether it's more beneficial to stay at one publication and try different little things within that? Or do you see, or is it like more marketable if you try like different publications, if that makes sense? I think people move around a lot more these days, but I'd say it's nice to spend a, a couple years at one place where you can really get in there. Um, you don't need to have a journalism major. I would say I'm biased because I don't have one, but um, <laughs> you can, but I think it's looking for opportunities. If you want to be on camera, Sheila, you need to start recording yourself on camera. Um, you need to just do it for fun. I mean, you need to do it with your own iPhone and um, practice like delivering something to camera. Um, do a story like something you're doing for your writing. Why don't you think about, okay, let me just test out. Let me see if this could make a video. You can shoot on your iPhone. I mean, I've, I've shot the things that are airing on, on TV and on digital, these are iPhone shoots. I've done entire shoots on an iPhone, interviews on an iPhone. And even something as simple as iMovie, I mean, I don't know what access, everything's weird now. You guys don't have access to like go to the media lab to edit stuff, but I don't know if you have the software on your computer or anything basic, but I would say practicing trying to put together a story because really you're going to want to put together a reel for yourself and that's something you have time to do you're you know you're you're you have some time um but maybe there are internships i think interning at a tv station would be good for you to try to get in there because that's a place that you can also start to maybe build your reel and experience and um i know i had when I got closer with some camera crews, I would sometimes ask them, oh, can I try to do a stand up? You know, would you mind after we finish everything, would you mind if I just give it a shot to do it? And you you can have people film you and then you can look at that and you can improve from that. So, um, and then look for opportunities. At my university, I was always like editing our, the, the videos for one of my clubs that I was in and, and they were funny and ridiculous, silly videos, but it just kind of, grew my love for editing and and putting video together so if there are any clubs or anything you're a part of you know offering to film or offering to you know do a short report on it um 
you want to get yourself that experience because it just takes hundreds of times of being on camera. I've been able to, when I was running my section of NBCnews.com, I got to, I was like, well, I'll do interviews. I'll interview people. And so if someone was on the Today Show, maybe I would see if they could talk to me afterwards. Um, you know, actors and actresses and, and such. And uh, yeah, it was a learning experience. Certainly the first, if I look at the first one I did compared with the last one, the last one is going to be much, much better. You get more comfortable. So I think um, you can start to record. If you're doing a sit down interview with somebody for a story, why don't you set your iPhone up and just try to conduct it like you're, you're doing an interview and you might not use that, but you can at least look at it and say, oh, it looks like I'm always leaning like this. Let me work on something or I'm, my, my voice is, is pitch is going up. Like what, what? That's interesting. Let me see if I can, if I can give myself some feedback on that um, and get involved with the NABJ Philly uh, chapter. Um, they are really, there's some great, amazing journalists in Philadelphia um, that I know and and I know they have a really great chapter of of, of the organization now so I would suggest um, getting involved with them absolutely yeah I just to add to that so I I know maybe you don't have you're not pressed to do a video I mean a short video or just do something for TV right now but also to improve your chances of being picked up for an internship. I think you also need your own reel, something to show. I mean, send us links, samples of your work, a reel, if you want, that would really get you noticed. And it's pretty simple. You could do a Vox Pop, maybe just do on the street kind of interview. You shoot it with your iPhone, like Amber said, come back and there are so many apps like makeup artists and influencers are using so many apps to shoot very, very interesting videos. So you could just try your hands with that and see what it looks like. And it also, it also helps to do a stand up because I found out that that's like one of the most difficult things to do. You need to be very comfortable and you also need to be, you need to memorize a lot of things you wanna say. So you could actually try that with maybe someone, you could do it outside or whatever, just, Make sure you film that and see the pitch of your voice, um, how long you're able to talk without just taking breaks or panicking or, or whatever. And you can you can just try your answers. Five minutes, three minutes, record yourself. And that really that is what you also need to even be comfortable being behind the camera or just even going out to interview people. And you can look at different, I mean, you may look at local news and network news anchors, and you may look at Vice. I mean, there, and, and NBC News even has a different, I think it's NBC News Now, there's just a different kind of vibe from their on-camera reporters. And you can, which I think is very refreshing that more and more, um, there's less, you know, I am, it's Amber Payne and I am reporting live. It's like, you can just talk to people and you can just be yourself. So I think, you know, there's not one box these days because there's so many different formats, like the Vice News is just a little more, is more conversational, it's a little more, I, I'm a real person, you're a real person, we're having a conversation, whereas, you know, there is kind of an air to, to network and local anchoring of just, you know, having that presenter voice and style and you know that's a personal thing too, you know, you may prefer one or the other, you may find yourself going one way or the other um so there's a lot of options <laughs> I feel like you're thinking of another one here no <laughs> if we have, if we have the time um, i'm curious what what are your thoughts for kind of blending print and and more like multimedia or like video um like I guess like I'm so as you guys have been talking, I've been thinking about a project I'm taking on, uh, looking at a hydroponics farm, um, and I'm thinking like that would be something that would really lend lend itself well to like to visual to actually be able to like kind of follow along how this it's it's a it's a weird agricultural technique, um, and I was curious like in what ways have you if you guys have been able to kind of blend. Um, print and video together to be like collaborative rather than um, rather than necessarily like 
covering the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Mikey, do you have any? Um, I, I'm not really familiar with, uh, can you tell me what, what you're working on again? Um, it's, oh, it's called aquaponics. So it is basically fish poop in water. The water with poop gets used to fertilize plants and they filter the water and then the clean water goes back to the fish. But there's a little bit more than that. And it's looking to be like a very sustainable um, oh, but labor inducive wow. like technique. I, it was an example, I guess. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. necessarily need to be that, just um, but got I think my that, head thinking. Yeah, I mean, as you're describing, and I, I'd, I've, I've, I've heard of this technique um, for like urban farming, I think. And uh, I mean, I think you're, you're exactly right that you don't want it to be the same thing. Like, number one, you understand that, that is, you are ahead of many people. Um, so I think it's like looking at what will complement it. Okay, so if you have your story, which is giving you all of the basics of how this works, um, then you start thinking of like, well, what would supplement this? What else do I want to see? So if you, I think you kind of tick through the mediums, like, okay, if I was going to do a photo slideshow or, or in, incorporate a photo essay or kind of incorporate photo between, you know, how does that storytelling compliment um if you were going to do a video you know is it a video of the process or is it like an explainer video where it's like text on screen how does how does hydroponic what is hydroponic what are aquaponics and then it's you maybe you do an interview with the, the person who's like the farmer and you do a tight interview with him where he's saying well here's aquaponics step one you do this step two this happens you have to have like a very clear interview with him you could edit that together put some text on screen because some people don't do sound on video anyway. Um, and then you have an explainer because, and then you have something like, if I don't feel like reading your whole article, I might just want to watch the video. Okay. It's 60 seconds. It's short 101 aquaponics 101. Um, maybe you don't even need this person, but you do the interview so that you have the facts and you have the contextually, how do I phrase this, this video? Um, or maybe you already know it and you have a fact sheet and you just pull like bullet points over and you just, you know, over stills or over video, if you can film the, the plant, if you can film anything at the place, or if this, these people provide you with stills, um, I'd say the explainer would be the way to go. And then you might say, oh, I want to have some audio incorporated. Like maybe I'll interview different people. There's the farmer, there's the harvester, there's the, you know, I don't know this other guy and you know, you wanna just have kind of these interviews with each of them and you could embed that kind of, as you read through the story, you could have a, an audio sound bite that I can play. Oh, let me listen to farmer, farmer Sheila, who's gonna talk about this. Okay, and then you kind of go to the next chapter of the story and you get to play another audio clip. So I think thinking about, well, what do I want people to get from my story? I want them to learn what this is. Some people are, what is the social? I think thinking about how is this going to go out on social media is also part of it. How, what's the tweet? What's the Facebook post? And you should be thinking about that when you're doing your stories because <laughs> Leah's with me on this because it might be a boring, you know, it, you might not have, like, you got to get people to read the story and draw them in. So having that in mind, and, and I had a, I, my, 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 my EP from nightly news, he would always say, what's the headline? What's the tease? If you were pitching him a story, Oh, I have a great story. It's about this people making a difference. What's the headline? What's the tease? How do you, you know, the tease meaning at the end of the first block of the show, when the anchor says coming up next, you'll never believe how they do it. <laughs> like, <laughs> how do you get people to get, wait, I want to know how they do it. We got to stick around through this commercial. I need to know how they do this. Um, so just ask yourself that question when you're, when you're doing a story and Vanessa, you, you ask your, your writers that question when they're pitching you stories. Um, what's the headline? What's the tease? What's the tweet? You know, how do we, how do we go? How does this go out on social? Like get challenge your staff to think that step through. I couldn't, I mean, that, that's, I, I was just smiling when Amber was saying it because we have a template at CNN when you are coming with any story, 
you need to give us the headline. Are we going to tweet it out on Facebook, on Twitter, on, on Instagram? What's going to make people click onto this story? I mean, digital is all about clicks, right? So uh, anybody that is pitching anything to you, coming with you with any story idea, and also when you are writing the story, that's the first. It seems really petty because you have this, you have this story that you like, but why should anyone care about it? So the headline, the tweets, and it just saves you, just gives you the structure of how the story is just gonna go in your mind. But I wanted to say, um, like explainer videos are really very good. And I'm not, I want people to actually do more of it because it really works. People get the gist of the matter. They get to the art of the matter quite quickly. And I think Mashable does a good job of that. You could follow Mashable on, on Twitter just to see some of their work. I think now and this, they also do pretty much a lot of that. Like they give you just a snapshot of what they are talking about. This has happened, now this is it. And this is this, I've really learned a lot just looking at their digital yeah. videos. So yeah, yeah. Mashable. Mashable, um, there are pretty much a bunch of them out there, but I, I usually look at them and they do a lot of tech stuff too. They know how to digest um, text stories into very simple videos, very simple text. Sometimes they even go viral. So, yeah, yeah. yeah the text on screen medium, Vanessa, may be very approachable for incorporating video and multimedia into your stories currently because it's a bit lower tech. Um, it's not shooting video. It's you know having some kind of editing software to string together stills and add text on screen and it can um, not only add views but add to context to a story you know the three things you need to know we, we did a bunch of those at BET just because they were it was like kind of low-hanging fruit like anytime the awards shows would happen you know the top 10 fashion moments from the BET awards okay it's basically just stills and, you know, the names of the artists, you know, it was just very easy kind of photo gallery brought to life. Um, but still people really wanted to engage with, with that kind of content. So. You know, what just came to my mind, you could actually try it out with a Google doc, just put a Google doc, visual text, visual text. Imagine that in the photo gallery and you have like a text on screen, you just impute it into a software. And you have like an explainer, an explainer kind of video. So you could try, you could try your hands with it on Google Slides. Photo, text, yeah. photo, text, photo, text, and and play it back here. Yeah. So anyway, it was nice talking to you guys. Nice meeting you guys. I hope you got something from this session. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much, um, and that really, really helped me think about this project, but also like how I might be able to incorporate it more in the future. Yeah. So. Well, I'm so glad that we just had us. This was awesome that we. Could I know this is so nice. <laughs>